Please welcome Chair Albright Stonebridge Group, Secretary Madeline K. Albright. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. I thank you very much for being here this morning in what I know has already begun as a fascinating discussion and will continue. And let me just say how incredibly proud I am of President and Secretary Clinton, of how they have pulled together all of us and their ideas and how to make sure that the programs are actually carried out by people on an individual basis. We have with us three extraordinarily talented individuals, including last year's Nobel Peace Prize recipient, Tawaka Carmen, the co-founder of the group Women Journalists Without Chains. Tawaka's organization has played a critical role in Yemen's democratic evolution through its commitment to freedom of expression and the use of new media to document human rights violations. We also have Paul Farmer, the United Nations Deputy Special Envoy for Haiti, Chair of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard and Founding Director of Partners in Health. Paul has dedicated his life to treating and curing infectious disease and to bringing modern medicine to those who need it most, particularly in Haiti, Peru, and Cuba. He is also a prolific writer, and be sure to pick up his recent book, Haiti After the Earthquake. And finally, we are pleased to have with us Jimmy Wales, the co-founder of Wikipedia. As a professor at Georgetown, I can tell you that Wikipedia is considered by many of today's college students to be the only source of information that they will ever need. Uh, and, and I also um, have to say that um, uh, I used to work for Encyclopedia Britannica, that book, and so uh, that has definitely gone out of style. Uh, these three individuals will share with us their experience in using the power of community, local and global, to advance positive change. CGI is a perfect place, I think, for this conversation. Its vision to turn ideas into action is by its nature transformative. And what I have to say is so exciting about the longevity of CGI, we not only have commitments, but we also get the progress reports. And I think that gives us all a sense of where this is going and how well it's working. Because participants in CGI don't accept poverty and other plagues as inevitable. We look for ways to achieve what others say can't be done. And instead of placing our fingers in the air to determine which way the wind is blowing, we enlist the help of others to change the direction of the wind. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. So the... Uh The plan for um, now is I'm going to ask uh, a question each, and then it will be up to you. And so I am very, very happy to ask the first question of Tawako. Yemen, uh, <laughs> Yemen remains in a process of transition, with its ultimate direction still unclear. What do you see as the immediate future for your country, and what are your long-term goals, and congratulations to you. It is really wonderful to have you with us. Thank you so much. I am so happy also to be here. Uh, but my question is why it's unclear in Yemen. It's very clear. People, they uh, stepped down the dictator. They uh, kicked him out from the, uh, from the president uh, position, Ali Saleh now. He isn't in the, uh, in the, uh, as a president in our country. And we are in Yemen, and we are in Egypt, and in Libya, and in Tunisia, and inshallah in Syria. We are now in the transitional period. We are, we finished the first goal of the revolution, of the peaceful revolution. We could, uh, yani we, we could step down the dictator, and now we are in the second step, and third step, and fourth step, which is removing the corruption from 
all the institutions in the uh, in the country, special in the army and security forces, and also preparing our country to go to, to be the civil and uh, uh, modern and democracy uh, country. Uh, we are now in the fourth countries, um, uh, preparing ourselves and our community to have a new constitution that will guarantee the democracy and human rights and equal citizenship and rule of law and accountability and all the values that people struggled and fight and died for. What is our uh, goal? What is my goal for this, for the transitional period in Yemen? If, if we talk about the national uh, yani, uh, step or in, in the national, because I have uh, also international, because I'm now in the UN uh, high level panel for, for writing the goals of the uh, international, international development goals. So, but in national, yes. Uh, uh, we want now to build the country because we know that revolution is destroy and build. We are now building our countries and we know we want now to make, uh, in addition of the political, uh, um, um, political process, we want to make sustainable development. So we have to, to work hard for that, but we know that as we succeeded in step down the dictators, we will be succeed in building these countries. And inshallah, on the, all the countries around the world that suffer from their dictators and from the corruption. Thank you. Wonderful, and let me just say that we know in this country that democracy is not an event, it is a process. Uh, and also the development and political and economic development go together because people want to vote and eat. And so I think that w the way you see the future is very important. You see it that way. It's very important and we are so optimistic. We are so optimistic of the rule of the people there at that countries. But also we tell all the international community that they have to, t to, to make the responsibility. Now the development in this com in the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the development in these countries, it isn't just the, the responsible of people in that countries. It's the responsible of all the world. So it isn't something g by giving to these countries as a gift or as a help. No, it's your responsibility as people in, 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 inside this small uh, uh, small earth, which is uh, um, a small village. So we have to work with each other to help these people in Arab region and in all over the world, the people who, yani, who, sa who, who served Saadia, uh, who served the humanitarian when they stepped down the dictatorship. Look, there is no peace without development and there is no development without peace. We need peace from these countries and we need peace from all, all over the world for, the, for our small uh, uh, city, for our small village, for the, uh, the earth. Without development, we will not help them and we will not help ourselves. It's our responsibility, the, uh, the responsibility of the international community now to to, yeah, to to achieve or uh, yeah, their values uh, of uh, helping uh, freedom, equ equality, equ accountability, rule of law, and also development. Development is very important, and we have to help these countries to yeah, to be strong. If they just step down the dictators without development, that that will make a, yeah, a big you know, question and a big fear. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, I'm going to ask you a, a difficult question. I think that, in fact, the international community did step up to a great extent um, in Haiti, and enormous attention and effort has been given to Haiti, uh, and which is a relatively small place and a fairly homogeneous one and, and close to our own shores. So, and yet, um, publicly, I think there's a perception that some of the issues are not going away, uh, or even over time. And is this perception wrong, or is Haiti um, resistant to transformation? You've done such an amazing job, so this is not a particularly nice question, but I, I do think it's important to answer it. Well, thank you, and it's certainly a, a, fair, a fair question. And I, I think um, that it is wrong that Haiti is somehow resistant to to change and, and as you you know the historical facts as do I and I won't go over them but Haiti's had a lot of attention but not all of it of the positive sort 
I mean, it is it, Haiti is the creation of a slave revolt, as you know. And so, you know, most of the Haitians with whom I've been lucky enough to work are very conscious of that history. And then you go into the 20th century and think about the attention that was paid there in 1915 and 1934, for example, the um, United States occupied Haiti militarily. So those roots, the so, sort of social roots of the contemporary dilemmas uh, are very real, uh, whether we will it or no. I would just say since, I, and I know what you're referring to, Madam Secretary, is really the, the very positive attention that was paid to Haiti after first those four um, storms um, and then the earthquake, and which seemed like a, an awfully uh, a difficult couple of years as it, as it was. It seemed that way, and it was. And I think that if we look at the date, uh, how long ago was the earthquake? What well, was uh, 2010? Not that long ago. And in development, as, as, as you said, and as you uh, point out, people, they, they want to vote, but they also need to eat. And the paying attention to the need for safe housing, uh, that the, the freedom from want, uh, as, as you implied, is very critical. So the development agenda. And to do development requires long-term engagement. And, and it also coordination of that goodwill. And uh, again, I think I'm echoing things that you've said before. There's a lot of goodwill right now. There's a lot of attention. There are a lot of, here at uh, CGI, for example, you'll meet scores of people, uh, groups working on uh, development uh, in Haiti. But I think we're going to have to stick with it for some decades. Uh, just one little example, if I may. Since the earthquake, my colleagues, my Haitian colleagues and my colleagues at Partners in Health have built in the middle of central Haiti a massive medical center. Uh, and it's already up in, it, it's 200,000 square feet. It's a, a giant endeavor, uh, a huge hospital, six operating rooms, et cetera. There's still the challenge of running it, but I'm saying it takes a while to build things, and it's not at all true that you can't make, uh, build uh, endeavors like that in Haiti. We've done it with working closely with, with Haitian colleagues, and I think we need to push forward that agenda, building Haitian institutions. It'll take time, but it'll happen. And I think we have to keep paying attention because things do take a long time. And it's interesting, the discussion in the plenary about um, property rights. I know that that's one of the issues in Haiti. People want to build, but they don't know who owns the land. Uh, and the government is the one that has to give legal empowerment to the poor. So there are any number of, of different aspects to this. But you have done an amazing job. You're really and if I could just say, in my line of work, which is largely public health, um, uh, you know, again, not going to property rights because I don't know much about the jurisprudence aspects. But, uh, and I, I summarize this in the book you were good enough to mention. After the earthquake, if you look at how much money went into public sector, um, which is required for public health, it's really under one or two percent of the massively uh, generous gifts. And I think we have to up that a little bit to try and find out how we could support Haitian institutions. Um, more and I and this is self critique as well. I think we we need to push ourselves in order to have goals that would would strengthen Haitian institutions, in, in, including the public health sector and public education. Great, thank you. Well, Jimmy, I have to tell you, I take this very personally. The founding of Wikipedia. I did work in one of my first jobs for Encyclopedia Britannica, and in days when newspapers still had space at the bottom of columns and had to justify it, I would read the Encyclopedia Britannica and come up with facts so they could fill the columns. So I can tell you that ostriches are voiceless, according to Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, so, I, but what you have done is now create a new model in, uh, that's in virtually every imaginable language. And and, and I think it is used all over the world. And so I wanted to ask you whether this is the ultimate research tool, or do you expect something to come along that will put Wikipedia out of business? And how are you making sure that that doesn't happen, according to Encyclopedia Britannica? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's, uh, it's very difficult to predict uh, the future. I, I always say if I, if I knew what the next big thing was I would start building it today. So uh, I think that um, one of the things about Wikipedia is that, uh, you know, right now uh, we're getting very, very close to having 500 million people uh, using the website every month. 
Um, we're a charity, a nonprofit organization. So, uh, and we exist from donations uh, from the general public. Is the is the vast majority of the money that we get is small donors. So, in terms of thinking about uh, you know what might come along to surpass Wikipedia or something like this, we don't anticipate a lot of. Uh, business competition with this because frankly it's a very very bad business um, we we get just enough money to continue our work and uh, you know like like many nonprofits uh, we are always uh, concerned about fundraising and things like that although don't worry Wikipedia is stable enough but uh, uh, we don't see a big push for that I mean when you you give everything away for free under a free license allow people to copy it do anything they want with it uh, you don't put any advertising on the site you don't charge anybody any money um, it's not very appealing to compete with that because it's it's about as free as you can get. So, uh, but still, I do think uh, you know the interesting thing about about your question is well, is it the ultimate research tool? And in some ways, of course, it is. Uh, it's available to everyone instantly. The kinds of things that in the past we might think, oh, you know, I, I, there's something going on in Yemen, but I don't know much about Yemen. I think I should go to the library and get a book or look something up, and people really didn't. Now people do, they actually do in real time. Uh, they hear something, they wanna know more, they go and they look on their, on their phone or, or what have you, and this is happening all around the globe. At the same time, we're always uh, uh, quite passionate about trying to improve Wikipedia. We want it to be as good as it possibly can be, and um, the press helps us a lot with this because they beat us up every time we have an error, but, uh, um, we do think a lot about how do we how do we continue to think about the quality of Wikipedia and how do we make it better than it is today? And how do you uh, change the language in it, or what is the people can submit, right? So how do you make sure that what it does say is correct? Well, we've got a very strong community of people who are very, very passionate about Wikipedia and about our editorial standards. And they do a great job of monitoring things, looking at things. In fact, des despite the fact that you know we're this crazy new wild thing from the internet, um, our community actually turns out to be very, very old fashioned. Um, they always want to know a, a reliable source. Uh, our standards for what counts as a reliable source are exactly what you would expect. We're looking for uh, quality newspapers, magazines, uh, preferably academic research that's been published and peer reviewed. Uh, we frown very much on using tabloids as sources for anything. Um, and so it's just an ongoing process of fact checking really uh, that enables us to uh, to check something. Now, just uh, this morning, uh, yeah. her, her, she said to me, um, well, my name is spelled wrong uh, in the title of the Wikipedia entry. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of sources uh, for it. And so I changed it. But it, we did at least say there are variant spellings in English. But she has a preferred one. After they, they, they write it uh, in all the word in the, in the wrong way. But so. probably because they, it's but this funny yeah, sort of circular finally, thing. Finally he Thank because you we, so much. we we reference, uh, you know, we would follow maybe what what does the New York Times say? But the truth is, probably the New York Times just looked it up in Wikipedia. <laughs> so there is a bit of circularity. At some point, you've got to get down to the real source. Uh, uh, but what's interesting is I, I changed it, and I, I guarantee you sometime later today somebody will say, do you have a source yeah. for this? But I thought uh, you were going to change the spelling of your name. Yeah. <laughs> I did. I fixed it. Yeah. No, she would. Oh, she would have to. Yeah. No. I will, yeah. No, we'll, we'll let her keep I her name as she likes Maybe I have to make it. another passport okay. or something. <laughs> but really, thank you for, uh, for all your effort. In Wikipedia, uh, they gave a good resource for all people who doesn't want also to read books. So he gave the information, and that is... M very important step uh, yani, uh, for people to take the information, to take uh, knowledge and, you know, now in the internet yeah, and yani, uh, World Wide Web. So he, he make a good uh, yani, resource for all the, uh, all the world and uh, I hope that he yani, make it more yani, because uh, sometimes you have s small information in any things so mm -hmm. he has to make it, uh, he has to make a strong effort for, you know, for uh, make his uh, work uh, to be any wide. Yeah. yeah, I mean, one of the things that we that we yeah. are pushing uh, is growth in all the languages of the world. So, of course, you know, English is a, is huge, uh, French, German, Spanish, all of the European languages. Uh, Arabic Wikipedia, for example, I think has about 150,000 articles. So it's pretty big, but it's nowhere near as big and comprehensive as we would like it to be. So we're really uh, actually Arabic is one of our is I think it's next year is our priority language. Um, to really make a push to get more editors and more participants uh, in Arabic. And I do think the, the role of the internet in, in the, the kinds of revolutions that 
uh, people like you are leading is incredibly powerful, but I think a lot of times when people talk about it in the media, they, they only recognize the most superficial piece of it, which is people using Twitter or Facebook to get organized to go out and have a protest, which is important, but there's also all the work that went on before that, behind that, as people began to look around through using the internet, they're able to read Wikipedia, they're able to read news sources from all around the world, and they're able to say, wow, look what they have here in this country, uh, look at that country there, they have this, why do we have to have this same dictator for 40 years and we hate him? Uh, maybe we could have institutions like that. And they begin, hopefully, to use the internet not only to learn that change is possible, but also to think about, oh, how do you write a constitution that is actually going to, you know, lots of constitutions have things written down. Oh, yes, freedom of speech. Nobody pays any attention to it. Um, you've got to have the structures in place and enabling everyone to get involved and to find easily at their fingertips some information about things like that I think is incredibly powerful. Very good. All right, um, now it's up to you and questions from the audience. And if you have one of the panelists you want to ask or just generally. And their mic's kind of circulating. Yes. Well, I want to ask a question. Could you of, identify yourself? Sure. I'm Blair Holiday, um, the CEO of the American Society for Clinical Pathology. And I've had the opportunity to work with one of these gentlemen up on the stage, but I'm going to target him for a second <clears throat> because uh, Paul Farmer is a foot soldier uh, in the healthcare sector. He's an agent of change, and we know what he's done. Um, I'm very interested on what the next steps are, Paul. And Particularly, at, Paul, you've been working on communicable, on non I'm sorry, communicable diseases, infectious diseases. We know this is, we've made grand strides across the world to prevent HIV. And now people are walking around un, with undiagnosed non communicable diseases like breast cancer and cervical cancer, et cetera. What do you recommend, if, as NGOs, what do you recommend? Uh, from the perspective of an, an emerging country, whether it's Rwanda, or wherever you feel in Sub-Saharan Africa, issues occur, Paul. Where do you believe that NGOs can assist in making ministers of health and making those healthcare infrastructures evolve to recognize undiagnosed disease so that we can all work together and hopefully effectuate the right kinds of changes? Well, thank you very much, Blair. And this, uh, allows me to make a somewhat wonkish point, but I mean, in an audience where I think we could, getting back to the Secretary's question about uh, about Haiti and, and my answer, which I know she agrees with, you, you have to be able to make a long-term investment. And another way of saying that would be that NGOs, which are well known to be more nimble than, uh, say, a government, um, uh, you know, which by definition has, if, especially if it's if it's democratic and changing, it's hard for governments to make long-term investments, <laughs> and and NGOs often don't make the kind of long-term investments you'd need in order to uh, promote health, because the the task at hand is really to build systems. So, to all of you uh, present, some of you will have focused on a certain problem like breast cancer, you mentioned AIDS. Uh, we have met to talk about how we can introduce pathology. You can't, I, I actually am quite proud. One of my claims to fame was getting President Clinton to say at a meeting of the American Society of Clinical Pathologists, tumor is rumor, tissue is the issue. It's not very catchy, is it? What that means is you have to build systems to be able to diagnose illnesses. It's more captivating the way he says it. Yeah, he it it sounded a lot better. <laughs> so here's what I would ask uh, of, the, of those assembled here, knowing that we have a lot of ground to cover. To be an agent of change in healthcare, you have to be committed to building health systems. And that's hard to do. It involves working with public authorities, working with local partners, working with survivor groups, working with patients, working with community health workers, doctors, nurses. It's really the long haul uh, work, and, and it's not something that's going to be done in a year or two. And that's why, you know, the, the next agenda, if you're following uh, public health trends, demography, epidemiology, is we have to think about the non communicable diseases. Uh, and, uh, and, and focus on building systems to allow us to identify and whenever possible prevent uh, suffering and death from those diseases. And it's not going to be as easy as, say, focusing on one problem, whether that be wiping out polio or uh, attending to a problem like tuberculosis or, or AIDS. 
I also think on that, especially on the women's diseases, is that sometimes it's also societal, that women do not take the time to go and get screened and do the various things because they're supposed to be taking care of their families. And there has to be persuasion of the fact that the only way to take care of the families is if you're healthy yourself. So it's a whole set of issues. And I think Paul and I have talked about this, is that all the issues require many players. It requires the government, the public-private partnerships, the individual, uh, the non-governmental organizations, and people who understand the importance of a long-term um, commitment to these kinds of things. But it's many things. And I mentioned a hospital, which I'm very proud to have mentioned, but we also have to roll this right out to community levels for the reasons that Secretary mentioned. A lot of times people, especially women, uh, and especially women living in poverty, are not uh, accessing, to use that kind of crass word, accessing the services, but we can roll those services out right to the community level, to the household, to the village, and I think that's one of the th ways to move the agenda forward. Great. Did you have a question up front? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Dan Malura from uh, Rad Aid, and my, my question goes to the, the whole panel. It, it involves the issue of uh, scientific publishing. Um, as Dr. Farmer will know, um, whenever we try to bring scientific data to uh, the public, we rely upon scientific uh, journals uh, for relaying that. Unfortunately, now there is a, at least a delay of one to two months as we go through that peer review process. And that bottleneck can slow the, the growth of our knowledge. So I'm curious about what your vision would be if a Wikipedia type um, model could be applied to scientific publishing or does the Wikipedia model really not apply um, when the issue of peer review has to be so managed and regulated? Thanks. Great. I mean, I think there are some very interesting uh, experiments out there right now uh, that are attempting to, to grapple with that issue. I mean, one of the things uh, that a lot of academics uh, have been concerned about for quite some time is that you know, if you think about the, the business model of a scientific journal, the successful ones, um, well, you don't pay the authors, you don't pay the reviewers, and you charge the libraries a fortune to gain access. This is problematic from the, from the perspective of the spread of knowledge, uh, for one thing. Um, most people who are publishing really want their research to be used um, and to be spread and, and be useful to the world. That's very difficult if, uh, particularly in the developing world, when people can't afford access uh, to the journal articles in the first place. That's one of the problems. So there's a big movement around for open access publishing, uh, looking at new business models around how to uh, fund the publication process, because it, the journals do provide a valuable service. Um, and uh, to look at uh, you know, possibly having the funding for that um, associated with the grant to do the research originally to fu fund the publication cost so that then after it's been published, after that peer review process, uh, it's freely available. In terms of the speed of the process, though, of course, that is probably uh, an issue. It doesn't matter how you fund it or, or what the, the process is, the business model. Uh, but today, with the internet and, and uh, you know, the ability for people to come together in groups and, and collaborate more quickly, the traditional timelines of traditional publishing start to make less and less sense. Uh, one of the things that you might want to look at is uh, uh, Public Library of Science Plus has Plus One, uh, which is an online peer review system where people can go and pub post uh, their papers. Other people can review them. I don't, I'm not an expert on Plus One. I, I met with them uh, a couple of years ago when they were first working it out and getting it started, but I'm I'm of the opinion, I've been told that it's working out reasonably well. Uh, and I think there should be more experiments like that. Uh, certainly in, in some areas, in, in high energy physics, uh, as I understand it, uh, they now, they just publish their papers to a particular archive, uh, in part because, you know, when you're working on a, a giant multi-billion dollar machine, uh, you can't afford to wait a year before you publish the results of the experiment you did last week. You need to get that out there right away so that the next experiments that are going to be performed can, can you know, take into account what was just done. Um, and it's the same thing when we're thinking about uh, fast-moving areas in, in health or any other area where that two-month time delay is costing lives. Uh, you really want to be able to get it out there. And some of this is institutional uh, that, 
you know, uh, yes, the peer review process is important, but we could view that as an after the fact uh, certification for tenure purposes or what have you. But in fact, we would rather have people just get it out there immediately. Uh, that does interfere, though, with the current business model of journals where they're going to sell the the access later. So I think there's a lot of lot of pieces to this that are are rapidly changing, and I think that's a really good thing. I want, back. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Tom. I want to add something on this point. Um, it's very important to have yani, the access to information as a right, as international right. We have to fight for this thing, thing to be as a treatment in the UN. And uh, um, it isn't just published. And also the right of people to access to, to this information. That means that we have to encourage all the people around the world to have their right to access to, in, to the internet. Uh, to have uh, to, to have the internet as a free and to have is is a simple for them to to yeah, and to have the internet now in in our, in the uh, uh, development countries and uh, under development countries they don't they they don't have their access to information or their, their their ability to access to the internet most of them they are illiterate most of them they don't have uh, electricity most of them they, they don't have um, so yeah, I, uh, information is acknowledged and uh, yani, uh, to make the people to uh, to make people to be good they have to have knowledge they have to have information and that is that is what is in in the internet now yes it isn't enough we have to make it more open for everything, but also we have to make internet to reach internet to everyone in this world. Yes. My name is Sunny Anishtar, and I'm the founding president of an NGO think tank uh, called Heartfile in Pakistan. I'd like to congratulate whoever put this panel together, because the three examples from each of the panelists highlighted three of the salient attributes that need to be institutionalized in developing country health systems in order to bring about change. So Paul talked about institution building, which is so important. The Nobel laureate talked about value systems that center on democracy and that center on development. And then our friend from Wikipedia talked about the importance of interconnectivity and its pervasiveness. Uh, and I feel that in order to bring about holistic, long-standing, sustainable change within the developing world, you need to pull a thread through these three attributes and exploit the synergy. Now the question is, what, we, what would be the catalyst of that change? And if I look at these three pillars in the context of the <coughs> remarks and the, the stellar remarks made by Secretary Clinton in the morning, uh, we see a new wind of development blowing, a new paradigm of development, which has the potential of cascading change in the developing world. So my question is to you, Secretary Albright, to what extent do you th think this new promise uh, holds potential of cascading change in countries of the sort that we come from, where institutions, institutional capacity ero is eroded, and where the potential to exploit synergy is just not there. Well, uh, <clears throat> let me just say I, I do think that there are huge opportunities, but they require a lot of work. Secretary Clinton talked about that. She asked me to head something called Partners for a New Beginning, which is very much based on uh, trying to operate in four areas, which is economic empowerment, science and technology, people-to-people -people exchanges and education. Those are the vertical pillars. And the horizontal ones are how to get youth and women involved. And what has to happen is there has to be a dedication from the top, uh, where we, in fact, have an American steering committee of CEOs of NGO presidents, presidents of universities. And then, which is the crucial factor, is to have a local chapter where civil society is represented within that particular, whatever country, from that level, so that you've got a grassroots uh, push on it as well as a top-down push. And also, I think what Paul had been saying earlier, a long-term commitment. I think that what we have in the world is a lot of generous people with very short attention spans. And what we have to do is make clearer that there are not immediate results, that they require this kind of work and the cooperation of a variety of different players in this. I mean, we used to think that development was a bunch of development experts who had <clears throat> very serious looks at development theory and strategy, and not enough of kind of mixing the political with the economic 
and then the sustainability. But that, that would be my answer. And I'm very proud, I had this Partners for a New Beginning, of a way it is a mechanism that does in fact put public-private together with local um, grassroots uh, aspects of it. That, uh, can I just add one thing? I mean, um, really just to echo and amplify what the Secretary said. You're, uh, if memory serves, a cardiologist, um, but we're frustrated uh, by the, you know, when you use the term ver vertical, you frustrated that you couldn't reach an, enough people with uh, clinical practice, nor were there the appropriate supplies, et cetera. If, if, that doesn't mean, however, that there aren't serious problems, cardiological problems in, in Pakistan. Uh, it's just that it was not the, the venue for you to do, and the time for you to do that uh, then. But I think if we take this long-term view and link institution building, as you said, and institution building to an openness, the, what, what Jimmy talked about, to generating support for the basic rights, you know, of, of, of the freedom of, for information, to information, as you said so eloquently, but also to freedom from want. I mean, it is possible to imagine the kind of uh, vision that we heard about this morning um, of, you know, le less of you know, unnecessary suffering and death, frankly, whether regardless of the of the uh, the, the causes. So, I'm I'm just uh, an optimist as well as far as public health and uh, goes. We can make these advances and make them stick. Yes. Thank you, Secretary Albright. As usual. You summarized everything. We're too impatient. Yeah. And to you, Paul Farmer, I, I've been down to Haiti many times. Can you identify chiefly, yourself? Chiefly through the Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, the president encouraged a lot of us to get, get behind it. And people say to me, why are you still on Haiti when we have such problems here? I say focus on the issue. I have never thought of Haiti being a short-term issue or within my lifetime solved. If we haven't solved our problems in a democracy, well, I think Haiti's coming a long way. I'd like to, to summarize this and ask a question. Why does the press continuously show the worst part of Haiti instead of the progress? I am going to interrupt because we have somebody here who has done a lot of work on Haiti. President Clinton? and the panel another hand. They did a great job. And uh, this is a really cool commitment. <laughs> I'm jealous. I wish I were part of it. I, I want to, uh, well, I sort of am now. I want to invite <clears throat> to the stage Murad Farid of Delos Living, Deepak Chopra of Dallas Living, Steve Bing of Shangri-La Industries, Terry McAuliffe of Green Tech Automotive, Will I Am of the I Am Angel Foundation. And I just learned before I came out here, Will I Am became the first artist ever to be music to us from Mars. He sent it to Mars and it came back just like it was supposed to. So he is not a Martian, he is an American who has been on Mars at least digitally. Good man. And Jason McClellan from the International Living Future Institute. Here's what this commitment's about. The average American are, uh, spend 90% of their time inside making the conditions of indoor spaces where we live, work, learn, and play of profound importance to our health. In response to this challenge, Dallas Living is committing to creating a well-building standard, not just a green building standard, a well-living standard. 
the first building rating system to focus on the effect of construction techniques and technologies on human health. The framework for healthy buildings is meant to operate alongside the existing building standards, such as LEED and Living Building Challenge. But rather than focusing just on environmental sustainability, it will zone in on immediate human health effects. Buildings will be judged according to 12 health categories, including respiratory health, cardiovascular health, healthy weight, and metabolism. They will begin work with Shangri-La Industries on six homes, 41 wellness-themed hotel rooms, and 500 office spaces to showcase these healthy building standards and hopefully do something that will literally change the way we live and work in a very positive way. That's exciting, huh? Wouldn't you like to be part of that? So let's give them a big hand. Thank you.